Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering part two of the video that I did on pituitary and adrenal gland dysfunction. If you haven't watched part one already, please make sure you do so. It doesn't go in any particular order, so you can watch this first and go back and watch part one. But there are lots of um, very valuable, important concepts that you do need to know. So I highly encourage you to make sure you watch part one of the video. If you haven't done so already, guys, please be sure that you do what? You know what I'm gonna tell you to do, like and subscribe below. Make sure you press that red notification button so you'll be notified every time a new video is released. And without any further ado, guys, let's get started. First question, what dietary alteration should you make for the client with Cushing's disease? A, high protein, high carb, low potassium. B, low carb, high calorie, low sodium. C, low protein, high carb, low calcium or D, high carb, low potassium fluid? And I'll give you guys a moment to think of your answer. Okay guys, and the correct answer is B, a low carb, high calorie, low sodium diet. Why? Well, what are we talking about here? We're talking about Cushing's, okay? Remember how I told you in part one, Cushing's is basically the opposite of Addison's. In Addison's, where you needed to add salt, add sex, add sugar. In Cushing, they've got way too much salt, sex, sugar, which is what? Salt, your mineral corticosteroids, your sex, those androgen hormones, sugar, your glucocorticoids. This patient has too much of it. That's why the patient with Cushing's, they have that um, moon-shaped face, right? Because of that fat um, distribution. They've got the buffalo hump. They've got very thin, fragile skin. They've got the purple striate. That's the picture of your patient that has Cushing's um, disease. So the correct answer is B, low carb. What do carbs break down into? Sugar. Didn't I just tell you that Cushing's is a patient that has too much salt, too much sex, too much what? Sugar. You think they need any more sugar? No. So they need to be on a low carb diet. Um, high calorie, I really don't agree with that because study after studies have shown um, low calorie. Why? Because this patient, because of all of um, these steroids in the patient's body, they already have gained what? So much weight and they tend to be very heavy, okay? So the only reason um, I'm going with this answer, high calorie, number one, that's the best choice that we're given, that's number one. And number two, we know how, um, calories, protein, uh, vitamin C is good for healing. And so that's the only thing I can think of. But really, when it comes to cushion, we want low calories. This patient's already going to be overweight, okay? And of course, low sodium. Why? Because the patient's already got too many mineral corticosteroids. You think they need more? Absolutely not. So that's why B is a correct answer. Um, what else did I want to tell you about Cushing's? Oh, of course. Um, just keep in mind something else about the low sodium. You have to remember sodium um, attracts what? Fluids, which will what? Bring up the patient's um, blood pressure. So we have to be very careful when it comes to patients with Cushing's to be monitoring their blood pressure as well, especially with the sodium retention. Next question. For what complication is a client with hypercortisolism at greatest risk? A, skin breakdown, infection, GI ulceration. B, anorexia, constipation, hypotension. C, kidney stones, weight loss, cataracts. Or D, diabetes insipidus, bradycardia, arthritis. If you've been following my videos for any amount of time, I have drilled this into your head. So I know you know what the answer is, but I'll still give you a second to think. Those who are new to my channel. All right, guys, don't play with me. You know the answer is A, hypercortisolism. This patient's got cushions. They got all this cortisol, all of this what? Steroid. What do we know about steroids? I talked about this also again in my part one video. Very heavy on the stomach. They can cause what? Ulcerations, and those ulcers can start to bleed, the stomach ulcers. What else do we know about uh, steroids? Fractures. Um, they make the bones porous, puts the patient at risk of um, fractures. What else? Hyperglycemia. Steroids are very sugary. 
right? And the fourth thing is infection. Steroids mask the signs and symptoms of infection. Remember in part one, I was telling you, these patients that have been taking steroids for whatever reason, if they've been taking it for, um, taking it chronically for an extended amount of time, right? Their signs and symptoms of infections could be masked. So a normal patient who's not immunocompromised, the minutes they start to get sick, the temperature will go up, right? But this type of patient, by the time their temp starts to go up, they might be full-blown sepsis. Okay, so you have to watch them much, much closely. And that's why that's your answer. A, skin breakdown. They have very, very thin, very fragile skin. And when I say thin, I'm talking about paper thin. You see the purple striae on their skin. Um, infection. Why? Because steroids mask the signs and symptoms of infection. And of course, GI ulceration. Patients who are taking steroids are at risk for ulcers. That's why they can't even take anything that has aspirin in it. Because the last thing we want them to do is what? Start bleeding out. So that is why A is your correct answer. Next question. The client who's been taking high dose corticosteroid therapy for a month to treat inflammatory condition, which has now resolved, asks you why she needs to continue the corticosteroids. What is your best response? A, it is possible for the inflammation to recur when corticosteroid therapy is altered, excuse me, is halted. B, Corticosteroids are a type of hormone. Once you've been started on a replacement hormone, you must continue the hormone replacement therapy for the rest of your life. C, the drug suppressed your own adrenal gland secretion of corticosteroids. Slowly decreasing the dose over time allows your adrenal glands to start adequate secretion again. Or D, the drug suppressed your immune system while you were taking it. Slowly decreasing the dose over time prevents your immune system from starting up too quickly and initiating an allergic reaction. And I'll give you guys a moment to think of your answer. Okay, guys, so the correct answer is C. And let me explain this to you. As I said in part one, you never stop steroids abruptly, ever, ever, ever. You have to what? Patients have to be weaned off, right? And the only time we don't wean a patient off, they have to be on it forever, is if they have a condition that their body naturally is not releasing these steroids anymore, such as if a patient had a bilateral adrenalectomy. They don't have those adrenal glands anymore. They're not secreting those hormones that the patient absolutely needs to survive, right? They're going to have to be on these steroids for the rest of their life. But if they're taking high dose steroid for like, um, let's say it's a COPD patient and they have an acute infection that's happening and they need to decrease that inflammation, okay? Or there's something going on with them that they just need those high dose steroids just for a short amount of time right? Because there's an acute situation, we're going to wean them off of those steroids. And as we do it slowly, it's like their adrenal glands wake up and say, whoa, I'm not, the body's not getting these steroids anymore. So I better start releasing them. I better start secreting them, but it has to be done slowly. Okay. So that's why, um, C is the correct answer. Let's go through the wrong answer choices. You have A, it's it is possible for the inflammation to recur when, um, the corticoid, when the corticosteroid therapy is haltered. Even though it is possible for this to recur, that's not why um, we're slowing it down over time when we're decreasing it slowly. B, corticosteroids are a type of hormone, yes. Um, once you've started on replacement hormone, you must continue the hormone replacement for the rest of your life. That's not always the case. The only time they're going to need to replace it for the rest of their lives is if the gland that's secreting that hormone is either not there or not functioning properly. So another example is if a patient gets a thyroidectomy, that thyroid gland has been removed, right? So there is no thyroid gland to release thyroid hormones. Well, the patient's going to need those thyroid hormones or they're going to die. So for the rest of their lives, they're going to be taking a replacement such as Synthroid, right? But if it's not that type of situation, the patient just has to be weaned off. And then um, choice D, it says the drug suppressed your immune system while you were taking it. True. Slowly decreasing the dose over time prevents your immune system from starting up too quickly and initiating allergic reaction. No. 
Absolutely. And guys, absolutely, absolutely not. And guys, I keep telling you about this and they'll try to trick you. Only part of the answer will be right. If the whole thing is not right, if there's one word in the answer choice that's wrong, the whole thing is wrong and you have to choose a second best answer, okay? And I don't want you guys to get tripped up on it because you'll see an answer and you'll love it so much. But one tiny little thing is wrong. That one tiny little thing made the entire thing wrong. Don't doubt yourself and get rid of it. So the correct answer, guys, is C. Okay. All right, moving on. Your client who had a transphenoidal hypophysectomy two days ago now has nuchal rigidity. What is your best first reaction? A, encourage your client to do active range of motion exercises for the neck. B, document the finding as the only action. C, take the client's temperature. Or D, administer pain medication. And I'll give you guys a moment to think of your answer. All right, guys, so the correct answer is C. I want you to think about this. It says that the client who just had a transphenoidal hypophysectomy, so they did surgery where they went into the brain, right? Patients post-op. What do we know about post-op? We don't care what kind of operation the patient had. If they had surgery on the brain, they went through the nose. They had the surgery on the brain, they cut their head over. And they had surgery on the heart. They had surgery on the leg. They had surgery on the spleen, the liver. We don't care. If a patient had surgery, there's three huge concerns that we're worried about. One, infection. Two, hemorrhage. And three, them developing a DVT, a clot, or that clot uh, traveling and is now a pulmonary embolus, Right? or embolism. So those are our three concerns. So before we go any further, we know the patient just had surgery. So those three concerns are already going on in the back of our minds. Infection, hemorrhage, or DVT slash PE, right? And then now we keep going. <gasps> patient how has a nuchal rigidity. Now I did a video on this, so I know what you know where I'm going. Guys, the minute we hear nuchal rigidity, what is the very first thing that comes to our mind? Meningitis, which is an infection of the brain or the spinal column, right? Hello, this patient just had a uh, surgery. Now we're seeing a nuchal rigidity. We're thinking infection, meningitis. What's the first thing you're gonna do? Assess, take the patient's temperature. Look at our other choices. One, encourage your client to do active range of motion exercises for neck. Oh my gosh. I literally can't even. Not with you right now if you chose the answer. Okay? Choosing A says that you have no clue what is going on. You did not catch that at all. You're thinking, oh, well, they just got stiffness in, my, in their neck. Let's do range of motion. You better not. You will lose your license. Okay, B, document this is the only action. And I went in on you on part one of my video when it comes to documentation. You do not choose that answer of documentation unless everything is fine and dandy. Is everything fine and dandy in this situation? No, it's not. Okay, you do not document, you do not continue to monitor unless everything is perfect. And that is not the situation. Something is wrong here. Okay, then you have choice D, administer pain medication. That's also you not realizing what's going on and you're giving pain medication. Hello, you're gonna take that client's temperature because you're suspecting patient has an infection. You're, what kind of infection are you suspecting? A meningitis. They gave us lots of clues for our minds to go towards infection and meningitis and that's why it's our correct answer. All right, guys, a neck, neck. Next question, which statement made by the client who's going home after a transphenoidal hypophysectomy indicates an adequate understanding of actions to prevent complications from this treatment? A, I will wear dark glasses whenever I'm out of doors. B, I will keep the cat food bowl on my counter so that I do not have to bend over. C, I will wash the incision line every day with peroxide and redress it immediately. Or D, I will remember to cough and debreathe at least every two hours while I am awake.
All right, guys. So the correct answer is B. I will keep, and this is how they tried to trick you because you're thinking, ew, cat food, why would I have it on my table where I'm eating? But look, on the counter, excuse me, not the table, on the counter so that I don't bend over. I just told you in the last question that we did, this is a surgery that they um, do in the brain. They get to the pituitary and it's done. They usually go, they go do it through the nose up to the brain or the mouth, but they usually make a decision up through the um, nose to the brain right? Any surgery that has to do with the brain, we're always, always, always watching out for and trying to prevent the patient from having increased intracranial pressure. So the patient cannot do anything that will increase that pressure in the head, in the skull, in the brain, such as what? Bending over, coughing, sneezing, performing the Visalva maneuver, anything that increases pressure, the patient cannot do. And that's why B is the correct answer. We don't want anything that will cause increased intracranial pressure. All right, next question. Which client responses demonstrate to you the treatment for diabetes? Wait, I have to do that again because I cannot read. You guys know I can't read. Which client responses demonstrates to you that treatment for diabetes insipidus is effective? A, urine outputs increase, specific gravities increased. B, urine outputs increase, specific gravities decreased. C, urine outputs decrease, specific gravity is increased. Or D, urine output is decreased, specific gravity is decreased. And I'll give you guys a moment to think of your answer. All right, guys, so the correct answer is C. Urine output is decreased, specific gravity is increased. That's how we know that the patient's getting better, the medication's effective. So as um, I talked to you about in part one, the difference between diabetes insipidus and SIADH, they're opposites, right? In diabetes insipidus, your ADH is down. Antidiuretic hormone, down. So guess what? That patient's urinating all over the place. That patient's going through dehydration, they're urinating so much. But even though they're urinating all over the place, the specific gravity is very, very small. Why? All of those solutes that were supposed to be in the urine is stuck where? In the blood. So with diabetes insipidus, the urine output is up, the specific gravity is down. Why? Because of all those solutes that were supposed to be in the urine is in the blood, which means that the serum osmolality is up. And guys, you have to really think about this before you answer a question because it's very easy to get this wrong, okay? Because they will try to trick you, right? So in diabetes insipidus, the diabetes insipidus is like, is like Oprah. Oprah's always giving away. You get this, you get this, you, you get this. Diabetes insipidus says you get urine, you get urine, you get urine. This patient's urinating all over the place. And guys, diabetes insipidus is not to be confused with diabetes mellitus. Those are two different disorders. Diabetes mellitus is when your blood sugar is too high. Diabetes insipidus has nothing to do with that. With diabetes insipidus, it has to do with ADH. Your ADH is down. Your urine output is up. Your urine specific gravity is down. Your serum osmolality is up. That is diabetes insipidus, right? Where in SIADH, which is the opposite, SIADH, they're stingy. They're not like Oprah. They're holding on to everything. This patient's holding on to all their urine. They're not letting any urine go, right? In SIADH, the antidiuretic hormone is what? up. That's why the patient's holding on to all their urine. They're not letting anything go. Okay. Now, even though they're holding on to all their urine, the little bit of urine that they do let go of the urine specific gravity is what up. Why? All of those solutes have gone down in the tiny little bit of urine that has gone out. Okay. So when it comes to SIADH, which is the opposite of uh, diabetes insipidus, the urine output is down, but the urine specific gravity is up, but the serum osmolality is down. Why? Because all of those solutes that were supposed to be in the blood 
is in the urine. That's why the serum osmolality is down and the antidiuretic hormone is up. That's why they're holding on to all their urine all of that fluid. So that type of patient, they're the opposite of going through dehydration. That type of patient is what? Going through fluid overload. You think they need any more fluid? No. All right? So just keep that in mind when you're thinking about your AD, your um, diabetes insipidus versus your uh, SIADH because I know it can be confusing. So anyway, back to what we were talking about. Our question at hand, the correct answer is B because we don't want anything to increase. Oh, Guys, I'm totally on a different question. Ignore me. Our answer is C, because we're talking about diabetes insipidus. Urine output is down. I mean, excuse me. We know the patient's getting better when urine output is down and the specific gravity is up. Because remember, in that... Um, guys, I'm sorry. In diabetes insipidus, that patient is urinating all over the place and they're going through dehydration so we know they're getting better when they start holding on to some of that urine and we see that specific uh the urine output going down we know that that medication starts to become effective all right next question which of the following clinical manifestations alerts you to the possibility of side effects of desmopressin acetate therapy taken non-parentally by a client with diabetes insipidus a, fibrosis at the injection site, B, orthostatic hypotension, C, decreased urine output, or D, nasal ulceration. Okay, guys, so the correct answer is nasal ulceration. So patients got, um, let me look up, diabetes insipidus, they're urinating all over the place, right? And so they're getting um, des uh, desmopressin, okay? What's that gonna help them do? That's your ADH, helps you what? Hold on to the urine because they're letting go of all their urine. That's what's causing them to go through dehydration and all this electro electrolyte imbalance. So the patient's getting desmopressin to help them hold on to all the urine because right now they're just urinating all over the place. But look what it says, it says that they're taking the desmopressin non-parentally. So they're not getting it IV. They're not getting it in another route outside of the GI tract. How else can desmopressin be given intranasally? And so what are you going to be watching out for? Nasal ulceration. Because that's how it's given intranasally. And it can cause like irritation and agitation to the um, nasal mucosa. Okay. The client just diagnosed with hyperpituitarism and acromegaly is scheduled for a hypophysectomy. Which, which statement made by the client indicates a need for clarification regarding this treatment? A, I will drink whenever I feel thirsty after surgery. B, I'm glad there will be no visible incision from the surgery. C, I hope I can go back to wearing size 8 shoes instead of size 12. Or D, I will wear slip-on shoes after surgery so I don't have to bend over. All right, guys. So the correct answer is C because in this question, they're asking us which one rego um, requires clarification. Whenever you see a question saying, what requires clarification? What requires further teaching? That's really asking you which one's the wrong answer. And it's C. I hope I can go back to wearing size eight shoes instead of size 12. Well, let's go back to this question. Look at what it says. The patient's just been diagnosed with hyperpituitarism. That means that um, those hormones that are being secreted are going into overdrive, right? And acromegaly. So what are we dealing with? Patients having, obviously one of those um, hormones that are being secreted is growth hormone. So they're bones are getting enlar enlarged, okay? They're scheduled for hypophysectomy. A, I'll drink um, whenever I feel thirsty after surgery, that's fine. B, I'm glad there'll be no visible incisions through the surgery, that's fine, we know they're gonna go through the nose, we're not gonna see anything visible. D, I'll wear slip-ons um, so I don't have to bend over, we know that because it's surgery in the brain, you don't want the patient to do anything to increase pressure, 
All of those are correct. But see, your bones don't shrink. Now, this surgery will keep um, those um, excessive hormones from being released further. So keep those bones from growing at excessive rate even more. But it's not going to reverse it. It's not going to shrink the bones. So that's going to require further teaching. Um, I'm, I hope I can go back to wearing a size 8. From a size 12, absolutely not. So you're going to have to do further teaching with that client because they don't understand 100% what's going to happen after surgery. The mustache dressing of a client post-op Post-operative from a transphenoidal hypophysectomy is saturated with clear yellow tinge fluid. What is your best first action? A, document the finding as the only action. B, obtain a specimen for culture. C, test the drainage for glucose. Or D, notify the physician. And the first thing you're going to do, a priority, you're going to test the drainage for glucose. Why? We see this drainage. What color is the drainage? Clear yellow tinge fluid, right? We're testing for glucose because if it comes up positive for glucose, is this serious drainage? No, it's cerebral spinal fluid, okay? Because cerebral spinal fluid has glucose in it. Okay, and if it is, if it does test positive, we are calling the doctor right away. But you can't call the doctor until you have information to give to the doctor. Okay, and another telltale sign is when you look at the drainage, you'll see a yellow ring around the drainage. And that yellow ring is the glucose that's separating from the rest of the drainage. And of course, you're still going to test it and then call the doctor afterwards. So let's look at our wrong answer choices. Stop. We do not, we do not, we do not document until everything is perfect. Is everything perfect with this client? No. So we're not going to document and we're not going to continue to monitor. We're going to do something about it. All right. So we know that's wrong. Choice B, obtain a specimen for culture. Why are we obtaining a specimen for culture? Are we suspecting that the patient has an infection? No, we're suspecting that it's possible, possibly cerebral spinal fluid, right? So we don't want a culture. We want to check for glucose. And choice D, notify the physician. Notifying the physician would be something we do after we do an assessment and we find something wrong, such as being positive for glucose, right? You call the doctor and you tell the doctor, yeah, I see some yellow tinge fluid. He's going to say, okay, is it positive for glucose? And you're going to be like, uh, 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 no, you're going to, um, intervene first, right? Intervene. You're going to assess first. And then your intervention will be to call the physician and let them know what's going on. I can't believe I'm already almost out of time. This is so crazy. I feel like we just got started. Okay, next question. Which client, which clinical manifestations alert you to the possibility of anterior pituitary hyperfunction? A, enlarged hands and feet, heat intolerance. B, bradycardia, hypotension, somnolence. C, chronic constipation and darkening of the skin. Or D, hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, and hypercalcemia. And I'll give you guys a moment to think of your answer. All right, guys, and the correct answer is A. And I kind of gave you a hint with the last question, so I'm hoping you guys had answered that anyway. Enlarge hands and feet, heat intolerance. How do we know this? Let's go back to the question. It says, which clinical manifestations alert you to the possibility of, and this is your key, guys, anterior pituitary hyperfunction. That means everything in the anterior pituitary is going into overdrive. Now guys, you have only two things in your posterior pituitary, your ADH, which is your vasopressin, and then your oxytocin. 
Everything else is in the anterior pituitary. So your growth hormone, your LH, your prolactin, your thyroid stimulating hormone, all of that good stuff, all of that is in the anterior pituitary, which is going into overdrive, right? So look at A, enlarged hands because of that growth hormone. I just talked to you about that. That's going into overdrive. Heat intolerance, why? Because TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone is increased. You know what that TSH does? It increases your metabolism. So everything is up through the roof. Meta um, blood pressure is through the roof. Heart rate through the roof. Your cognitive function. You're going, 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 going. The metabolism, the body's going, 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 going. That's why the patient has heat intolerance because they're always like this. They're going to be hot, right? So the correct answer is A. Oh, I'm over time. Okay. <sighs> We're out of time, guys. I'm gonna do this one more question with you, but there's so much more I wanna cover. So I'm actually, I'm gonna do another video where I'm going to be covering um, thyroid dysfunction. I'm gonna do some more uh, endocrine with you because endocrine is very heavy and you guys definitely need to know this information for your testing. So I promise I won't leave you hanging. All right, last question. The client has a deficiency of all of the following pituitary hormones. Which one should be addressed first? A, growth hormone. B, luteinizing hormone. C, thyroid stimulating hormone. Or D, follicle stimulating hormone. And the correct answer is C, thyroid stimulating hormone. I just told you guys about what TSH does, right? Everything is through the roof. And TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, um, if that's out of whack, that absolutely can um, harm a patient's physiological integrity. And remember when I did my um, priority and delegation video and I gave you a list of the patients who are priority, the patients you're running to which fall under physiological integrity, isn't blood pressure on that list? Absolutely, right? Absolutely. Is it heart rate on that list? Absolutely, right? So TSH, this is essential for life. And you have too much of it or not enough and it can kill a patient. So out of growth hormone, luteinizing hormone, FSH, our priority is a TSH because that'll kill a patient and it'll kill them fast. Okay, I'm definitely over time. And I keep saying this, right? This is my last question. Then I have to end, guys. But I promise I got more coming. All right, last question. What safety measure should you use for the adult client who has a who has growth hormone deficiency? A, avoid IM injections. B, place them in protective isolation. C, use a lift sheet to reposition the client. Or D, assist the client to move slowly from a sitting to standing position. And you guys should all have gotten this right. The correct answer is C, use a lift sheet. Why? What did I tell you about growth hormone? The bones, right? So the gro growth hormone is an overdrive. Those bones are going to be big and bulky. But what happens when the growth hormone is down? It's weak. It's small. They're at risk for what? fractures. So yes, we're going to use a lift sheet to reposition a client so they don't break any bones. And that's why um, C is the correct answer. Look at A, avoid IM medications. That's for patients who have like bleeding disorders that we don't want them bleeding to death. Like if a patient has hemophilia, something like that, that's not the case with deficiency of GH. Choice B, place the client in protective isolation. Um, this patient doesn't have is not a severely immunocompromised. Um, that's not they don't have an infection going on. That's not the case. We're talking about growth hormone deficiency. And then choice D, assist them to move slowly. Um, that's for a patient that has issues with blood pressure. We want to make sure they don't go through orthostatic hypotension. And that's not what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with GH deficiency, growth hormone. So, guys, I hope um this video was helpful to you, please leave me a comment below. Let me think about, let me think, let me know what you think about this video. If there's anything you'd like to see me cover, 
Um, please don't forget to share this video with any classmates or you friends that you think um, would benefit from this information. Go ahead, press that like and subscribe button below if you haven't done so already. And of course, press that red notification button so you'll be notified every time a new video is released. And guys, please be looking out for my part one video on thyroid dysfunction and disorders. And I'll see you next time.